This is a production of West Virginia Public Broadcasting. For the lion's share of his 98 years, with pen, pencil, or most often a marker, Herschel Woody Williams would yield a napkin the way a great philosopher would opine on man's fundamental nature of knowledge, reality, and existence. To that list, Woody would highlight service, a lifetime's devotion of service to others, often manifested on a napkin. If you met with Woody, you know that he always had a project for us he would magically produce these napkins and Sharpies, typically with him diagramming the project out while we watched and listened. They were not always unused napkins, but they did become works of art. On June 29, 2022, Chief Warrant Officer for Herschel Woody Williams would go to his final duty station in heaven a role model for humanity, so loved and respected as to be honored upon his passing with two full military memorials, lying in honor at both the state capital of West Virginia and the distinction to be only the seventh American and the first West Virginian to lie in honor in the United States Capitol Rotunda. One of Woody's post-World War II workstations, the Huntington, West Virginia Veterans Administration Medical Center, was renamed in 2018 in Woody's honor. The Herschel Woody Williams VA Medical Center has been improving the health of the men and women who have so proudly served the nation since 1962. A place adorned with fond memories of their beloved namesake, maybe a few napkins here and there. He would meet somebody in the mall or at a restaurant or at a, at a veterans event and he would write their name on a napkin or just a little, you know, back of a, of a store receipt or something, you know, and he would come in and say, hey, I need you to call this person. <laughs> Woody planned his own memorial service down to the smallest detail. The garden alone. His grandson, Brian, extended a Williams family legacy of service, delivering marching orders for all in attendance, so yes, on napkins. Each of you at your seat should have a baggie with a napkin and a Sharpie. I want to share with each of you a project that he has left for each one of us. Please use your napkin and your Sharpie to take some notes. Governor Justice, Senator Manchin, you know well that your project is to accomplish an exit off of 64. <laughs> Major General Adams, I believe that Sunday he tasked you with getting a monument built at Quantico, did he not? Yes, sir. Kim Wolf, I know you're out there. I believe that you need to follow through and get that project done at the Arch so that we can have a Gold Star Family Memorial Monument there. Gold Star families, spouses, children, parents, siblings, or others whose loved one died in service to our nation. It's not about me. It's about them. It's about those who sacrificed their loved ones so that we can be free, so that we can continue to live in a country like no other on earth, have a freedom like no one else enjoys. Chad Graham taking the mantle of now leadership from the Gold Star family's Woody Williams, Williams Foundation that his grandfather oh, created, also noted at the West Virginia the Memorial that Woody had a plan of service for all, even the Almighty, likely delivered on a napkin. I also think about what he has told many of us. When I get to heaven, 
I'm going to ask God some questions. Why do you have to milk cows twice a day? Why'd you make me so short? If you ever have to send me back, could you make me commandant? But the other thing he wanted to ask God is why me? Humility, gratitude, and respect for all of those who gave their life for all of us and all of those he fought beside. I am certain, knowing him, that he is getting his answers from God. And I am also certain that he's making heavenly napkin notes of all kinds of projects for St. Peter and the angels to get working on. And as we feel his presence, pretty sure those are already being accomplished. His daughter Tracy says her father and mother Ruby guided the family by faith and by example. My parents um, had rules, but you just knew them. You knew the right and the wrong thing to do. Um, my mother was a very gracious, kind, quiet type. Um, Dad worked a lot. The youngest of Woody's five grandsons, Chad Graham, says his mamma Ruby needed that faith, plus plenty of guile and gumption, to deal with an extremely service-dedicated papa. It takes a strong woman, and she was just, like I said, the perfect complement. She was strong, she was wise, she was compassionate, and they made a wonderful team. Tracy says as a child, her father never really discussed the war or talked about receiving the Congressional Medal of Honor. She says it wasn't until she became a young adult that some of Dad's passion for service became a sort of self-therapy. Then I realized that Dad was helping people a lot of years with things that he was probably dealing with himself. And um, that was a, a stark realization that the turmoil that he probably dealt with, he's helping these other people learn how to deal with them and, and what directions they can go to get help. Chad says his grandfather told him that from the time he was a teenager, Woody knew he was destined for patriotic service. My grandfather so badly wanted to be a Marine. And when people always ask him what his motivation was to go into the Marine Corps, he would say, I was not gonna let anyone take my freedom. Woody remembered that some of his inspiration came as a West Virginia farm boy who saw two tall, strong, older guys in uniform come back home and tell stories. These two fellows would come home in their dress blue uniform. And I was around 12, 13, 14 years old, as some of the other kids with me were. And of course, they were telling us all these big fights they'd been in and all that kind of stuff. Probably most of it wasn't true, but it was, it, it got our attention anyway. And I apparently decided that if I ever went in the military, and I had certainly no plans, I was going to be a farmer, I guess, the rest of my life, but if I ever went in the military, that's what I wanted to be. When Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, five foot six inch Woody Williams knew he had to do something. He made his way as quick as he could to the Marine Recruiting Office in Fairmont, West Virginia. And he didn't even look at my paper, he just looked at me. And uh, he said, we can't take you. And I said, why? And he said, you're too short. So I left. I went back and, and, and as I recall, I walked back home because I didn't have any transportation. I walked back to the farm and they don't want me, I don't want them, I guess. But no, Woody knew in his heart that this was just a minor setback. Resolved to still become a Marine, a teenager Woody Williams still had to help his Depression-era farm family make ends meet. So he took a job as a cab driver in Fairmont for a few months. And it was during that time that he made some incredibly special deliveries. Woody found himself making deliveries to families with a Blue Star flag in the window, 
This means an immediate family member was in military service during a time of conflict. It was this experience that planted the seed for an endeavor that would last a lifetime. So at that time, we as a country were notifying these families of loss via telegram in most cases. And the War Department was putting these in these uh, kind of dark brownish yellow envelopes that were unique to that delivery. So my grandfather would get this telegram and I can only imagine what the first one felt like because he delivered multiples. Here's a young man once again. There's no military training. There's no training in, in bereavement or delivering the worst news that a family could ever receive. And at that time, a knock on the door was coming from him. A young man, cab driver, delivering this, this telegram, this Western Union telegram. We regret to inform you. That, that really, I think, planted a seed in him. It, it had such a weight that he carried with him in his heart, and it changed him. In the spring of 1942, they lifted the height requirement. On May 27th, Woody Williams joined the Marine Corps. He knew Japan was the enemy, and not much more. I don't think I ever hated the Japanese, really. Uh, I hated what they were doing, and yet knew very little about it. Uh, the, the radio, the little bit of radio that we could get, and we didn't even have a radio at home. We had to go to an uncle's house to listen to the radio. We couldn't afford a radio. And uh, the little bit of radio uh, chatter that we heard was saying that they want to take our freedom away. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. My fellow Americans, the sudden criminal attacks perpetrated by the Japanese in the Pacific provide the climax of a decade of international immorality. Powerful and resourceful gangsters have banded together to make war upon the whole human race. Their challenge has now been flung at the United States of America. The Japanese have treacherously violated the long-standing peace between us. The Congress and the people of the United States have accepted that challenge. There are two iconic places in America definitive to World War II, the Marine Corps, Iwo Jima, and Woody Williams. One is the National World War II Museum in New Orleans, Louisiana, and the second is the National Museum of the Marine Corps just outside Quantico, Virginia. The museum curator says the Iwo Jima display is a Marine Corps must, and it tugged at his heartstrings when he saw a World War II Marine like Woody with an Iwo Jima survivor's hat. Very rarely, only maybe the Bataan Death March or Iwo Jima do you see something like that, this hat that's just a survivor, and that, I think that, just soak that in what that means. And that's so typical of what a wonderful generation these men were and, and women, uh, they, they did not you know, see themselves as heroes in any regard, even a, a real true hero like Woody. Um, I loved his history where he was too small to join the Marines and they initially sent him back. And I, I think that's, a, that's definitely the guy I want on my side in a fight. He has that chip on his shoulder for sure. Further south at the National World War II Museum in New Orleans, the mission is to tell the story of the American experience in World War II in three ways. Why did we fight the war in the first place? How did we go about winning it? And I think increasingly important uh, to young people especially is why should we care about that, you know, 80 years after the fighting was over? It changed our country. Uh, it changed the world. Um, and I think that that will have enduring relevance for a thousand years. The Iwo Jima display notes that in 1945, the fighting in the Pacific was getting closer to the Japanese homeland on volcanic rock islands like Okinawa and Iwo Jima. It's the last battle in modern history where you have two enemy combatant forces intent on killing each other and there's nothing in between them. There's no civilian towns, there's no, you know, there's no bio right, there's no logistical lines. It's almost medieval in the sense of a siege mentality where something like the flamethrower comes in speaks to what the Marines were expecting. It's one of the most brutal, horrifying weapons. Nobody wants to be burned alive. 
it wasn't a popular weapon for Woody to, to carry that into battle. One, he had to sort of adjust himself morally to what he was going to be asked to do. And two, it's a hazardous weapon. You, know, you never know what's going to happen when you're carrying gasoline on your back and there's flames and people trying to kill you with this. February 21st, 1945, the 1st Battalion, 21st Marines landed on the beach at Iwo Jima. With that unit, Corporal Woody Williams, who had been trained in using a flamethrower. When you're assigned that incendiary device, you're also assigned an assistant. Because a flamethrower man carrying a flamethrower with 70 pounds on his back, he can't carry his pack and his bedroll and all the other stuff that you have to have. So uh, they assigned me a fellow by the name of Vernon Waters as my assistant. Now I'm five foot six, I was five foot six, and Vernon was six four. And so he had to carry everything that belonged to me. Big Vernon and smaller Woody trained together in Guam preparing for Iwo Jima and became fast friends. And he's moving forward and he's out in front of me 25, 30 yards. And uh, he jumps up to run to the next protective whatever he saw that might give him some protection. And the Japanese fired a, a mortar from the other side of the ridge where they were firing at us. And that mortar came in, hit him smack dab in the top of the helmet, and of course it was just like that. Well, I ran to him to see if there was any life, and there wasn't. So no sense in calling a corpsman for something of, you know. Vernon wore a big ring with a nice stone given to him by his father. Woody wore a little dime store ruby ring given to him by his fiance, Ruby. The comrades in arms made a pact that if anything should happen to the other in battle, they would make sure those items return home. Vernon would get Woody's ring back to his fiance. Woody would get Vernon's ring back to his dad. We'd been told that you don't take anything off of the body. But when I saw him lying there on the ground and there was that ring, and I remembered that pact that we had made. I tried to pull that ring off his finger. Of course, we hadn't bathed or we were dirty and filthy and I couldn't get it off. It wouldn't come off. And of course, I'm afraid somebody else is coming, but finally I spit on it. And you know, if you've ever had a ring stuck, spit on it and it'll slide off and that's what I did. And I went on about my business, stuck the ring in my pocket and went on. Going on, Woody learned from intelligence that the Japanese had 800 pillboxes, fortified structures with sinister holes used to fire machine guns, pillboxes dug into that Iwo Jima volcanic rock, and 16 miles of tunnels dug under the pillboxes. They had a hole that you could go up through into the pillbox, but if it got too hot in there, you could back down in the hole and go to another one, come up someplace else. Uh, I have said over time that it was just like fighting ghosts. Woody says his company commander asked him if he thought he might be able to do something about some of those marine killing pillboxes. Fellows who were with me in that same shell crater where they were having this meeting and where he asked me that question, they reported that I said, I'll try. What flamethrowing Marine Corporal Woody Williams did, covered mostly by four riflemen, was to shove his flamethrower nozzle into those Japanese pillboxes, killing all inside, then retreating to refuel, and under intense enemy small arms fire, returned to the front line time and time again to wipe out one Japanese position after another. Many of the flamethrower users in these pictures and film clips could be Woody Williams. Woody spoke fondly of the flanking Marines assigned to him by his field commander. He assigned me four riflemen and uh, uh, two of those Marines that day in the period of time that we were working on those pillboxes, uh, two of those got killed. Anytime I wear the Medal of Honor, I uh, try to say, and seldom do I fail, that I don't wear it for what I did. I wear it for those, particularly those two Marines, who gave their life, really, protecting mine. And it's very possible that I wouldn't be here had it not been for them. So it's, it really belongs to them. I'm, I'm just a caretaker of it. 
If you read this citation for his Medal of Honor, there's one word that Woody, if he could rewrite that citation, he would rewrite it because it said alone. One word. Alone. He moved forward alone. He resented that word. He took loss and from it somehow for the rest of his life created hope because for him, always about them, never about him. Them before him. Like so many World War II servicemen, Woody had a girl back home. Ruby Dale Meredith was the love of his life. He said he didn't marry Ruby before he left for the war because he didn't want to leave a widow. Ruby wrote me regularly and I was grateful for that. Uh, we, she wrote letters I, probably three, four times a week. And uh, we weren't allowed to have any chewing gum or candy during boot camp, none of that junk stuff. But uh, every once in a while, she'd slip a stick of chewing gum in a letter. In his letters from overseas, Woody wanted to keep Ruby informed on just where in the world he was. The problem was military male censors did not want that kind of information revealed. And um, so <laughs> Mother got this letter from Dad that had all these words cut out. And at the bottom, the censor person wrote, it, tell Woody to quit trying to tell things he's not supposed to tell and your letters won't be all cut up. <laughs> Woody's daughter Tracy shared one keepsake letter, written less than a month before Woody would be discharged. Friday night, September 9th, 1945, Guam. Darling, as I journaled last night, here I am. And I have all evening to write, so maybe I can do better tonight than last night. But I'll admit I was in a better mood to write last night. But I'll do my best, and then you will have to excuse me if I don't do as well. I never got any mail today, but after getting two such sweet letters yesterday, well, I can't gripe any. But as you know, I would love a letter every hour. I guess Mom and Dad were always just so much in love. And I tell people this, this is the honest, honest truth. Mom and Dad were married for 63 years, I think. I told you I'm bad with numbers. But anyway, I never heard my parents argue. I never heard a crossword. And that is the honest truth, never. It was October 5th. 1945, when President Harry Truman presented the Congressional Medal of Honor to 14 heroes, including the valiant patriot who now lies before us. In his remarks that day, President Truman said, we fought a good fight. We've won two great victories. We're facing another fight, and we must win the victory in that. <clears throat> President Truman knew that America's work was not finished, even after winning the Second World War. And likewise, Corporal Woody Williams, even after demonstrating the stunning heroism that earned him our nation's very highest honor, knew that his own work was not finished either. As President Harry Truman presented Woody with the Congressional Medal of Honor, his citation was read aloud for all at the White House ceremony to hear. For conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty, his unyielding determination and extraordinary heroism in the face of ruthless enemy resistance were directly instrumental in neutralizing one of the most fanatically defended Japanese strong points encountered by his regiment and aided vitally in enabling his company to reach its objective. Corporal Williams' aggressive fighting spirit and valiant devotion to duty throughout this fiercely contested action sustain and enhance the highest traditions of the U.S. Naval Service. Just after receiving the medal, still in Washington, D.C., Woody had a personal visit with Marine Corps Commandant General Alexander Vandegrift, 
himself a Congressional Medal of Honor recipient for heroism at Guadalcanal. General Vandegrift said to him, that medal does not belong to you. That medal belongs to those Marines that did not get to come home. So I can only imagine as a, as a young Marine who's just gone through hell and back, he's now home, he's been presented with the nation's highest honor for valor, and then to have what in, in his mind uh, was almost God to him in the Marine Corps, the Commandant, who was also a Medal of Honor recipient from Guadalcanal, really put upon him what it meant to wear that medal in the short time they had to spend together. He said, you wear that on their behalf. Don't you ever do anything to tarnish it. What immediately impacted and weighed so heavily on this young Marine just home from war, anxious to spend time with his soon-to-be wife, Ruby, was returning the ring of his fallen friend and comrade, Vernon Waters, to Vernon's father in faraway Montana. He and my grandmother get back to West Virginia shortly after the ceremony and, and all of the welcome, the hero's welcome. Uh, they were married that same month, and as he told, he said, I didn't have two nickels rubbed together, and they didn't have a car, so he borrowed a, a car, an old Dodge convertible, and he got my grandmother, and that first order of business was for him to drive to Freud, Montana, to take that ring back to Vernon's family. He had made that commitment. I wrote them a letter and told them that I had the ring, but I was not going to ship it. I was going to bring it. I'm going to bring that ring. And we delivered that ring to his dad. And you would have thought that I was delivering him all the gold in Fort Knox. Just tremendous. That challenging yet selfless task to return a fallen Marine's ring home set Woody on a life's path that exemplifies what would become his mantra and motto, the cause is greater than I. I don't think he served others the rest of his life because he received the Medal of Honor. He wasn't asked to be a counselor at the VA. He didn't honor gold families because of Iwo Jima. He did it, all those things, because that's who Woody was. It's been said that the blue cloth that holds that medal is this beautiful light blue delicate ribbon but it must be stronger than steel because the weight of what that metal is and, and the, the weight that pulls on, I think on recipients. And, and I think it was part of what drove Woody. It's, it's what drove him to serve families. It's what drove him to serve other, other veterans. It's what, it's what drove him to create the Woody Williams Foundation is you've, you've, got, you've got to wear that in a way that carries on the legacy of those, especially those two Marines that died protecting him that day. Woody Williams wore that Medal of Honor as a heraldic emblem of one Marine's dedication to serve others. Woody says what he brought home with him from the war that he was a bit lacking in before was confidence. I really hadn't decided at that point in time what I was going to do with my life. I sort of figured that I would go back to the farm. But uh, I had more confidence in, in myself that I could do whatever I decided I wanted to do. That newfound confidence guided Woody toward a new mission of service to help fellow veterans. Woody told the story of getting a letter in 1946 or 47, offering him a job at the then Huntington VA Center. And he didn't even know at that point that the that the VA even existed and um, during our renaming Woody told a great story about driving down here and his father-in-law's truck on bald tires and the interstate wasn't around and this was, at, maybe it was in 1947 um, uh, and, he, and you know, the interstates weren't around. So traveling from Fairmont, you know, Quietdale, West Virginia area to, to Huntington at that time on bald tires in the third week of January had to have been pleasant experience and he talks about that. Woody took the job, a veteran service representative at the VA, a claims assistant. The primary duty was to walk veterans through getting their GI Bill benefits, their VA home loans, compensation and pension. For some that might have been a rubber stamp job, 
But Woody's grandson, Chad, says Woody took every veteran's plight, big or small, personally and to heart. He had a responsibility to those that he served with, and he extended that to every single person in the military and in the veteran community, whether they were of his vintage, older, younger. At that job, Woody was somewhat voluntold that he would be spending between six months to a year returning to war on foreign soil as a veteran service representative in South Vietnam. Nimmo says that was difficult for Woody. He talked about what a challenge it was because he was in country you know, and what a challenge it was to get to, um, at that time, still active duty members that would soon be veterans and get them to a safe place so that they could be counseled on you know, what to do when they get home. Woody would often ask himself and others a simple two-word question, why me? Why was I destined by God to live this life? If there's probably outside of Jesus, if there's ever been a person that's never had to question and say, why me? You know, that would be Woody Williams. I mean, that's, and I told him, I said, Woody, just look at everything you've done since you were discharged, you know, and if there's ever a person that doesn't have to ask the question, why me, it's you. Now into his 80s, the impact of a young Woody Williams delivering somber Western Union telegrams to those Blue Star families never left his or grandson Chad's mind, heart, or soul. Chad remembers his papa speaking to a gathering of gray-haired West Virginians when he talked of patriotism and the Mountain State's many Gold Star mothers. He especially remembers the story of an emotional gentleman remaining in the meeting room after everyone else had left. And as he turned around and was packing up his stuff, he could hear this gentleman's footsteps on that wooden floor towards him. And he paused and turned to the gentleman and he saw tears in his eyes. And he said, sir, is there something I can do for you? Can, how, can I help you? And the man simply said, dad's cry too. Dad's cry too. The gentleman was a gold star father who had given his son. Chad says on the drive home that night, Woody stopped at the West Virginia State Capitol Complex War Memorial, where he had an epiphany that would shape the rest of his life. He stopped to visit and, and really just to think and internalize what he had just experienced with this dad who had given one of his own, that had given his son so that we could all be free. And he, and he just spent some time there and looked at all those names that are on the War Memorial there in West Virginia. And he went home and he conceptualized what has become the Gold Star Family's Memorial Monument. Consumed with passion for the project, Woody got together with his daughter Tracy, a talented artist in her own right. Well, he had a napkin with a bunch of notes on it, and he said, I want to tell you, I want to tell you what I want to do. And uh, I said, okay. So he gave me the idea that he had about the Gold Star Family Memorial Monument. And so we sat at the kitchen table in his house and, and just went through different ideas of, um, and he had in his mind that he wanted those panels and um, he had several things that he thought he might want on them. And we went through all that and went through different ideas and, and uh, we sketched it out that day. And once folks saw that and, and through um, media and news stories and the internet, folks saw this monument and you saw other folks get involved. You saw school groups, you saw Gold Star families say, hey, we would love to do that in our community. And you saw them start to pop up across the country. And now from that one, from that one seed, 121 that have been dedicated to date, and then another 70 that are in process. And we add about about every 10 to 12 days, we're getting a call and we're onboarding a new local committee somewhere in the United States that want to participate in this program. And it is so powerful to see. Beginning with the first at the West Virginia State Veterans Cemetery, Gold Star Families Memorial Monuments cover all 50 states, from the seashore to the plains, from the mountains to the heartlands. They can be found in dedicated spaces of all kinds, city squares, veteran cemeteries, state capitals, village parks. The monuments have a structural continuity, but are individually embellished with etchings that describe that particular state, city, community, and its people, and their sacrifices for the cherished freedom that Americans fought and died for. 
The mission Woody established goes far beyond erecting monuments. The Foundation's Gold Star Living Legacy Scholarship Program offers assistance to family members seeking education at all levels. The Foundation supports Gold Star families through partnerships with other nonprofit and service organizations to provide a clearinghouse of services for Gold Star families. Foundation supportive events like Gold Star Family Days at the ballpark are growing around the country, a tradition beginning with the AAA Louisville Bats. The families become ballpark VIPs. They're honored on the field. They throw out first pitches. Noah Hartman Martin and his Gold Star family came to honor Noah's grandfather, Army veteran Michael Martin, who died in the service of his country. Noah says being in the company of other Gold Star families helps ease the grieving process. They give us a chance to be recognized with uh, other people around us and, and put us in group with people that, were, uh, that have also lost somebody that served. And um, it's a great feeling to, be, uh, to know that we're, we're part of something. And uh, it's very, very nice to be around other people that know what it's like. Young Gold Star widow Brittany Lawrence traveled to the Kentucky ballpark from Alabama. Her newlywed husband Joshua died just after their marriage in a combat deployment to Afghanistan. She found initially that survivor outreach services were not a military priority until she connected with the Woody Williams Foundation. They allow the families to still be a part of a family. As when, you know, one of my biggest things going through grief was my world ended, but everyone else has continued. And having a foundation like this allows for me to continue living and honoring and being a part of a family all together that are still struggling. And this way we can all be together and grieve happily. There were organizations, but nothing had been done on a national scale to create something permanent to honor and to bring that to the forefront of the public consciousness. Tracy says in his last years, her father struggled to fulfill his promise to attend every monument groundbreaking. But the struggle was with missing the personal contact that stoked his spirits. He got to a point where he couldn't go to all the groundbreakings and, it, and then it, later he was in the hospital, he missed some dedications. But it wasn't about seeing that monument. It was about being with those Gold Star families um, and letting them know that somebody cares about them. That just, that was his drive. That drive came full circle for Woody in 2020, hearkening back to Dad's Cry too, with an indelible memory from a monument dedication. When we dedicated the Gold Star Family Memorial Monument in Wilmington, North Carolina, Naturally, we had a ceremony and Gold Star family members were there to uh, be honored for the loss or sacrifice of their loved one. And when the program was over and the monument was unveiled, a father, Gold Star family father, walked up to the monument and he had a little bag in his hands and in that bag were some of his son's ashes and he put those ashes at the foot of the cutout of that person missing. That is the first and only time that that has ever happened but it was a very emotional moment. He was a freaking rock star. Constance Whitaker first met Woody Williams on the USS Missouri for the 75th anniversary of Pearl Harbor. She forged a lasting friendship with Woody on the museum-sponsored Victory in the Pacific trip back to Iwo Jima. And that's when she knew. We would walk into an airport and he would shake everyone's hand. Any groups of Marines that were on Iwo Jima especially, I mean, when they learned that Woody Williams was there with us, holy cow, they, it was, they were in, they were absolutely in awe. They could not believe that they were there meeting Woody Williams. And Woody would go up and shake everyone's hand and, and thank them for their service and, and just wanted to talk to everyone and did.
Like a rock star. He was a freaking rock star. He was absolutely a rock star. He had essentially met every U.S. president since like 1946, and and he rode in Air Force One when President Trump was was in office, and you know flipped the coin at the Super Bowl and waved the flag at the Indy 500. I mean, the list of cool things he got to do was was not short. He enjoyed those times, but I honestly believe he enjoyed the time if he went to Pite Saunders Elementary and spoke to the kids there. He enjoyed that as much as, as, as you know, other things that he did. In his 2020 State of the State Address, West Virginia okay. Governor Jim Justice, after gesturing with a hatchet to make a point early on, then later praising Woody Williams as a home state hero and champion of Gold Star families and Gold Star monuments, broke protocol and invited rock star Woody to address the state legislature. Come on over here and just talk. They, they had a whole lot rather hear from you than me. Well, currently, we're in 45 states, 45 com states in this country, many communities. We've lost count of those. But they have put up a Gold Star Family Memorial Monument to honor those families that gave more than any of us. They gave one of their loved ones so we could be free. We've got 63 more that are in process somewhere in the country. West Virginia can be very, very proud. We already have seven communities in this state that have put up a Gold Star Phantom Memorial Monument to honor those in their communities. We have four more that are in the process and working every day, and in just a few months, they will be online. So it's happening all over the country because of the big hearts and the love that people show for those who gave so much of a sacrifice. We need $12,000 to meet our goal for our Capitol Monument. So I hope we can get $12,000 out of him. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you what, you can keep that little orange jacket and I'll give you the 12,000 tomorrow out of the contingency fund and you stay away from my hatchet. <laughs> Woody's grandson Chad says one of the things that was so unique about his papa was he never met anyone with that genuine of a heart. And that would always cut through any pomp and circumstance or apply to any situation, whether you were sitting in a, a little diner or sitting at the White House. Um, he treated folks, regardless of who they were, where they came from, with the same amount of respect. Marine Corps Commandant General David Berger noted that Woody maintained, perhaps elevated that rock star status after his passing, being among the very selected few to lie in honor at both his state and nation's capitals. I think beyond the Marine Corps, even Americans, every part of uh, this great nation lost a, lost a big one. And you could see that today if you walked around, and many of y'all did, you could see it in the people that were in the Capitol. You could see it in the people that were lying in the street today uh, to say goodbye. Grandson Chad says that rock star status was fostered from early on, from a man who strode on many walks of life. He was a West Virginian, a farm boy, a lumberjack, a slag shoveler, a taxi driver, a Marine, a warrior, a counselor, a teacher, a poet, a horse trainer, a son, a husband, a father, a grandfather, a great grandfather, a friend, and the most important, he was a servant. For the United States of America, we christen me Herschel Woody Williams. May God bless this ship 
than all who sail in her. On October 17, 2017, Woody's daughters, Travi and Tracy, christened the USS Herschel Woody Williams. Woody humbly said at the christening that the expeditionary mobile base ship named for him was all about everybody but him. I hope that my name being on this ship will in some way honor those Marines who never got to come home and those who made it possible for me to have the Medal of Honor. Two of those that never came home flanked and protected Woody as he used that flamethrower to neutralize those Iwo Jima enemy pillboxes. He was given four Marines to protect him. He knew two of those Marines, two he did not. Bornholz and Fisher, those are the names of the two men that gave their life. He did not know that for 70 plus years it was a casualty report, and we, we knew what division, we knew what regiment, we knew what battalion, we knew what company, we knew the date, we knew the location. Those were the only two. After some in-depth research involving the Williams family and the Marine Corps, the ship christening occasion somewhat paled in comparison to a grateful Woody discovering that Warren Bornholtz and Charles Fisher were the men who flanked him and gave their lives in combat. U.S. Marine Private First Class Charles Fisher's grave marker is in Hawaii. U.S. Marine Corporal Warren Bornholtz, along with PFC Fisher, are remembered with a marker in San Diego. Just learned two of those Marines who sacrificed their life that day protecting my, we now know, who they were after all these years. He had carried that medal, and until the day he died, carried that medal with them in mind every day. Um, he just hadn't ever had a name for them. And it was incredibly powerful for him to be able to say their names. Warren Bornholz, Charles Fisher. And we, we got to connect with their families, generations removed. But it still meant so much to them for him to be able to walk up to them and, and thank them for their loved one laying down their life for his, that's what it's all about. In 2018, at age 94, Woody made a return trip to the island of Iwo Jima and Mount Suribachi. Woody's grandson, Chad, and others joined him. I saw the flag after it was up, not before, but it did not something to me, and I think it did that for others at that particular time. We had lost so many Marines in just a few days, five days. So when Old Glory was on the mountaintop, it, get, it lifted the spirit of all of us. Iwo Jima is remembered with other names like Saratoga, the Alamo, Gettysburg. Remembered not simply because Americans were again conspicuously gallant in battle, but because our sons were called upon to endure unspeakable hardship for the sake of freedom. Your flag raising at Mount Suribachi remains a beacon, indeed a birthright for America's young people and for every future American. On behalf of all Americans, we salute today the men of evil. There in Iwo Jima, Woody was given some dog tags made by his family that bore the names of Fisher, Bornholtz, Waters, and Williams. Two of the men who fought alongside him that day and a best friend, totaling three, dear to his heart, who never made it home. Also on the tags, a Bible passage. John 15, 13 inscribed, no greater love hath any man than lay down his life for his friend. And I gave them to my grandfather up there and said, we want to present these to you. Do with them whatever you feel is, is appropriate. He unfurled them in his hand, took a minute, looked at them, thought about those names, and then he slowly presented and hung them where so many dog tags are hung atop Mount Suribachi, and with a very slow, respectful salute, 
paid that last salute to them. All of the dots connected there. We know that his legacy as Marines and as Woody, that's gonna continue. His bravery, his selflessness, his humility, all that exemplified the best virtues of this nation, which he talked about all the time. His enduring contributions, enduring, to our heritage, I think they've left an indelible mark on the legacy of our Marine Corps. His legacy is yours and mine. The two things that Woody Williams prized above service was his undying love for his wife Ruby and his faith. He told his hometown pastor, Chuck Harding, to ask those at his funeral to accept Jesus Christ as their savior. Pastor Harding did just that. I cannot think, and I believe I'm not alone, of anyone that personified more a Christ-like spirit in everything that he did not only for his God, who he loved, for his family, who he loved dearly, for the Gold Star families, and for the core. But it was Woody's wife, Ruby, who from the day he met her to the day she passed, was his rock. I've wondered many times, what would I have been? What would I have done? What would have happened to me had I not married Ruby Meredith? I will sometimes still, after all these years, uh, roll over in the bed and she's not there. It takes a fleeting second to realize she's not gonna be. But for the split second, I think she just got up and got out of bed. Yeah. So, yeah, I still miss her. And I tell her every night, and I've done it ever since 2007, but I love her, still do. Ruby passed on in 2007, right about the time that Woody began his Gold Star Families Foundation in earnest. His daughter Tracy believes that at that pivotal time, the Almighty intervened in this loving couple's lives. Mother didn't like to travel too much, like go far away. Like around West Virginia she loved. And, and uh, so dad was traveling a lot. And in the early 2000s, and dad, had, he knew that, you know, mother was in her 80s and she really didn't want to go on all these trips and he hated to leave her. And so he said, I'm, I'm going to slow down. I'm going to quit traveling so much. And he did. Uh, cut back and then the Lord took mother in 2007 and I always believed still do that God knew dad had a huge mission to accomplish and he would not have done all this if he were if mother were still here and he you know he was concerned about her so I feel like God said Ruby, I need you, and I need Woody to, to stay and finish his mission. And I, I just believe that's why God took Mom and left Dad. And, you know, Dad has done it.
because is greater than I. This has been a production of West Virginia Public Broadcasting.